Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, and for those that didn't make yesterday, um, welcome to today's uh, sort of second day of the Culture of Corn webinar series. And um, like I said, welcome back or welcome. We had a great time yesterday and lots of great um, conversation uh, amongst folks and hopefully we can you know have that same uh, good conversation today. Um, we have two wonderful speakers lined up to talk to us about our enduring connection to northern flint corn and I'm going to turn it over to them in a second but before I do I want to um, thank our sponsors for making this program possible. Um, the USDA NIFA um, grants program and SARE, who supported many, many of our research programs, and I know um, other researchers on this call as well. And then, of course, a shout out to the Northern Grain Growers Association. Many of our board members were on yesterday that co host uh, the grain events with us the normal conference we have and, and all the outreach that we do with grain as well. So um, just wanted to kind of give a, a shout out to, to those folks. Um, I know a few people had not received their boxes in the mail. We did figure out um, where they were, <laughs> luckily. And uh, if there is anybody else, please let us know. We'll make sure that you get those. The webinar from yesterday is being posted on that e-extension um, web course that Catherine and Henry sent out to you to access. So if you wanna watch yesterday's webinar again, or if you missed it, um, it will be posted up there and all of them will. All right, so with that, uh, like I, I mentioned, we have uh, two great speakers with us today. Um, Frank Kutka, Dr. Frank Kutka, who, I've known now for quite a while, and um, I believe Jack Laser was the individual that introduced us, and also um, I think introduced me to Margaret as well. And we had uh, some corn breeding workshops up at his place years and years and years ago, and that was the first time I met Frank. And Frank um, currently now um, is the is developing, I'm reading his bio right here, is developing a sustainable agriculture degree and also facilitating agricultural research at the College of Menominee Nation in East Central Wisconsin. And that's where Frank grew up in Wisconsin. Um, and that's where he also learned about corn and how to grow corn um, in Minnesota, New York, and North Dakota. His training is in field biology, aquatic ecology, I had no idea. Yeah, and plant breeding. Um, he maintains the Corn Culture Facebook and blog. Um, and so if you haven't seen that, hopefully maybe he can put that in the chat box for us um, so we can all um, see his blog and uh, learn about all the great things he's doing in corn. And he continues to breed corn on a small farm near Lake Michigan where he lives with his wife, Grace. Um, so thanks. Frank for joining us today. And then we're also joined by Rebecca Webster. And Rebecca is an enrolled citizen of the Oneida Nation in Wisconsin. And she's also a assistant professor of tribal administration and government governance at the University of Minnesota Duluth in their American Indian Studies Department. And prior to teaching at Duluth, she served the Oneida Nation as an attorney for 13 years, providing legal advice for the nation's administration, government, and land issues. She grows heirloom traditional foods with her family on their 10-acre farmstead. And she shared this beautiful white corn with us um, that hopefully uh, everyone received and we'll be hearing more about today. So with that, uh, Frank, I'll turn it over to you and then um, we'll, we'll um, hear from Rebecca after that. Great, well, thanks so much, Heather. Uh, nice to see you again and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Yes. All right, like it or not, there I am. <laughs> Going to share my presentation here eventually, I hope. There we go. Okay, so 
Uh, I'm going to provide some background about uh, northern flint corn so that uh, we have a, a clearer view of the predominant kind of maize from this part of the world and uh, take a look at some of its history, see where we're at right now, and uh, help set up uh, Rebecca's presentation, which will expand upon this background to look at uh, other cultural aspects. So what is northern flint corn? Well, some of it is flint corn. And by that, we mean the corn that has the very hard kernels. They're somewhat translucent. And uh, you, you wouldn't want to bite one that was raw. If you grind it up, it will make very gritty cornmeal. Great stuff. It's known for having relatively long ears with a few rows. So usually eight to 10 rowed ears. Um, there's some classic uh, varieties here on the left and in the, the other ad from a catalog here, Pride of Canada and, and some others. This uh, is Byron Yellow Flint. This is a photograph that I borrowed from the internet. Uh, you can see here, you know, obviously nice long thin ears, beautiful shiny translucent kernels that I guarantee are going to be very hard. Flint corn comes in many colors though. It's not just orange, or I'm sorry, not just yellow. It can be white, it can be blue, it can be red, it can be spotted, it can be striped. Uh, lots of different possibilities are to be seen. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful stuff. It's also flower corn. What, then we call it flint? Well, you know, Northern flint is just a larger grouping. Uh, it's a racial complex, if you will, in the biological parlance. What makes flower corn different than flint corn? Just one gene. One gene changes the way that the food is stored in the seeds so that instead of being packed tightly, it's packed very loosely. So we get opaque soft kernels that are very easy to, uh, to grind. Um, some varieties you can even take uh, uncooked kernels and just bite them without breaking your teeth, although you know one wants to be cautious. Uh, flower varieties are very popular because they're so easily processed. So whether you are out in the West, like this um, Hidatsa farmer uh, about 100 years ago out in North Dakota, or this fine group of friends over here um, at the Rickard a family compound in uh, Tuscarora and New York State with their beautiful white corn harvest there. Flower corns are very important, very popular. Flower corns also come in a wide range of colors. Uh, this is a variety from Montana. You can see it's been uh, selected for, for many different colors. The big difference you can always tell is that uh, well, except for the dark, dark colored ones, sometimes you have to break one to look, but uh, flower kernels are opaque and the flinty ones are translucent. But uh, don't always do, don't test them by biting. That might be incautious. <clears throat> Northern flint corn, it's also sweet corn. And how could this be? Well, if we look at these ears here, we have long, thin eight road ears, similar kind of stuff. This differs from flint again by one gene, which changes the way that starches are stored, in this case, not very well. So the kernels stay full of sugar that isn't processed correctly the way it normally would be. And so when the kernels dry, after staying sweet and tender for a long time, they end up wrinkly rather than plump. And so whether it's golden bantam, as we see here, on the left or one of the many kinds of uh, dark blue or even red uh, flower or uh, sweet corns that have developed across the region. Uh, it's still a northern flint type, it's just it's got the sweet trait. It's also popcorn. You know, for some reason, people in the past had broken down all these types of corn into almost separate species. But um, these only differ by a trait or two. So in this case, popcorn is just relatively small seeded, very hard flint corn with thicker hulls. You know, two or three genes different from your run of the mill flint corn is really all. In this case, this Spanish pop as it was called, and I, I don't know why it's from the Great Plains, uh, has long thin ears, eight to 10 rows. 
As you can see from the kernels, looks a lot like some of the early flints you may have seen. And if you look in the photograph on, on the left, it's from a publication about flint corns back in the 40s. Um, same kind of plant type as all the other flint corns. So even though it pops fairly well, I guess, for a, for a homegrown one, you know, not like modern popcorn, but it's still in the flint type. And, and these basic types or, or traits uh, go all across the whole group. So they are fine and leafy when you see the plants. And uh, unless you get rid of our list of names on the right, you might not see my, um, let me just see if my screen is showing here, there. See if that helps any. Uh, we have a, a picture of an actual plant there on the right and some uh, from long ago that are black and white. Northern flint types have very fine stalks. They're not thick, strong stalks. They have relatively weak roots. They have long, thin, usually drooping leaves. The ears tend to be long and thin, uh, frequently with long husks, especially if you're lucky. Um, the ears are usually placed mid-plant or below. And uh, as you can see from the kernels here, they, they tend to be not really long kernels. They're kind of uh, wedge-shaped to crescent-shaped. That's, that's the, the basic kind that you see in this uh, group as a whole. The taxonomy is a little bit messy. Um, clearly, it's all maize although people have sometimes divided it into separate subspecies or even separate species. There are two major races that the biologists who care about these things have identified, the Northern or Eastern or Northeastern flints and flowers and the Great Plains flints and flowers, I'm trying to include the fact that some is flowery and some is flinty because it's a little confusing unless you understand the, the basic genetics are hardly different. Both of these major groups have thin stalks, few prop roots, low ears, and they tend to have tillers, although some varieties have very few and some have so many tillers it's hard to tell what you're looking at. Flag leaves are also fairly common across a group, especially in the sweet corn uh, end of it, and, and those are separate leaf blades that emerge at an angle from the end of the husks at the end of the ears. Not always present, and sometimes they're absolutely huge. Uh, these two major racial complexes differ really only by areas of adaptation, the relative height of the plant with the western ones tending to be shorter, and the proportion of 12 row ears, which tends to be higher as you go west. But what about uh, the corn from the Gaspe Peninsula? What about Micmac varieties and other mini varieties? Uh, these are from the east, but they're very, very short. What about the popcorns at large, many of which have many more rows than just eight or 10? Um, and a question I always have as a biologist is, does race really exist anyway? Um, <laughs> where, where can you say that one begins and the other one begins? Where does one end? Um, it, it's, it's really kind of messy. It can be helpful sometimes to think about major groups with some sort of ideal type. But when you look at things individually, there's so much variation, it's kind of hard to really understand how the group hangs together well. So um, I include all of the northern flints in my mind as, as one large assemblage with a lot of variation. We know, um, anyway, and then let it go. that the, um, the northern flints are quite different from many of the other kinds of corn that we see across the continent. So definitely not like these highland types from uh, Lake Titicaca in Peru and Bolivia on the left, or from the central valley up in the mountains of Mexico on the right quite different looking ears from those. And the plants are also very, very different. Uh, here are some other flinty varieties uh, from the tropics and, and into the temperate areas. Again, uh, not only do we not have orange up here, uh, we don't have that many rows in our flint corns from the zone. And, and the ears are quite different from uh, this uh, Peruvian ear as you see. There are some long eight road ears to be found in uh, some kinds down in Bolivia, like this uh, Carapampa. However, the kernels are very, very different. 
in shape. Uh, there are other eight road ears in Peru, uh, Bolivia, and Ecuador as well. Um, obviously doesn't look uh, like the kinds of long thin ears that we see here. And uh, the kernel's shape is, is very different. The plant form is very different. So clearly, although they share some traits, there are some differences worth noting. And I think I would go out on a limb happily and say that the northern flints are remarkable and wonderful adaptations, uh, glorious uh, expression of a long relationship with corn in this region. Here's uh, Gaspé, probably the very earliest one that I'm familiar with. Uh, this is little flinty corn from the, a peninsula in uh, Quebec, southeastern Canada, that it extends out into the uh, St. Lawrence uh, and Atlantic basin there. Uh, these varieties are very, very fine stems, 18 inches to maybe three feet tall very short ears, very close to the ground. And I have grown this variety here in Wisconsin from planting to harvest in 60 days. So it's extremely fast. And, you know, obviously some of the other types uh, like this Tuscarora here, uh, the ears are enormous. The plants are much later, um, much taller, uh, much more productive we see some similarities and it's all part of the same uh, development of agriculture in this region. So it's really a great story. So when and how did all of this come about? Well, it's, it's complicated. So no matter what you call it, whether it's maize, corn, wapamen, anast, mandamen, sara, noa, ishim, motk, os, wagmiza, kohate, or kukuridza, like my people call it, it's wonderful grain. It seems to have come up north through the desert southwest, but exactly how is unclear because it doesn't look exactly like any of the corns from Mexico or from the desert southwest. It doesn't look exactly like anybody else's anywhere. It's very special stuff. So how did this all happen? Well, archaeologists tell us this story. So there we go. In the northeastern United States, southeastern Canada, small amounts of popcorn appears in the archaeological record starting from about 2,500 years ago, which is a, a very good long time. So a few thousand years after maize was domesticated in Mexico, it, it arrived here. Corn becomes an important food item here about 1500 years ago. So it'd been around for a thousand years, but it starts to ramp up as people are becoming much more intensive in their agricultural pursuits as they create an agriculture economy here that had not previously existed. And then the Northern Flints as we know them in form become the predominant most common type all across the region by 1200 years ago and forward. It is the kind of maze of indigenous agriculture and uh, early uh, European immigrant agriculture as well. Those folks who think carefully about this transformation say things like this, skillful cultivation and careful attention to the selection and improvement of variety was necessary to develop this corn here in this place. So within a thousand years of corn showing up, corn was developed alongside the entire development of agriculture into this intensive form. Um, in a thousand years changing it from the earlier forms into what we now see and what was used for a millennium. And is, is such a different kind of it's distinct biochemically the uh, the kinds of protein the kind of enzymes inside the plant is just different from every other every other type out there. It's remarkable corn and an incredible achievement to work with this. So where all was it? Um, basically from uh, South Carolina, Northern Georgia, Northern Alabama, North, uh, up the Ohio Valley, up the Missouri Valley, we find the Northern Flint types 
all of these big circles uh, from a publication in the 40s show that this type was found. So in the Northeast, uh, this is from New Brunswick, uh, Twitchell's Pride, we see these lovely long thin ears were the predominant type that moved up into the area. King Philip is a uh, slightly further south from Massachusetts. Uh, another one with the long eight road ears, this one uh, mostly brilliant red, and you can see the translucence of the uh, flinty kernels. It made its way up north of the Great Lakes into Ontario, and archaeologists have pointed out it's been there for about a thousand years as well. And so across all of the Haudenosaunee region, the area lived in by Hurons and other related groups, we have these beautiful big-eared varieties. Uh, Stephen McCumber there holding this uh, white flowery kind. And he also shared this photograph of Haudenosaunee blue, which is a very short-eared, but uh, blue flower variety. It's quite beautiful. Varieties recommended in Northeast by USDA include uh, quite a few, some of which are still in existence, which are starred here. So uh, they do have in their collection Angel of Midnight, which isn't commercial anymore, and Canada Yellow, which you can't find much. King Philip and Longfellow are out there some, Rhode Island Whitecap. Um, and you can also see some others that are, uh, because of Seed Savers Exchange members and other small companies have brought uh, Calais Flint and some others into uh, commerce. And there are groups of seed savers and other seed companies that do have some flints and the uh, northern grain growers there in Vermont also have some to share around among their membership. USDA has a fairly good sized collection and there are others as well. In the Midwest, we actually have a lot of corn growing that happened and uh, although that earlier map didn't show it. So this map here of Wisconsin shows all the counties and a number within each one for where archeological sites where gardening was taking place have been identified. On the right, we can see a photograph showing a, a field of mounds where corn was grown with other crops. And in the lower right, we see a field of ridges, uh, the other common type found here in Wisconsin. Uh, here on the Menominee Reservation, this extensive forest, there are actually archaeological sites where extensive agriculture was going on for some time. Uh, David Overstreet and uh, Bill Gartner and their research team for the last couple of decades have been examining these archaeological sites whereby they go in uh, where folks have found the gardens, they remove the vegetation uh, and then start to make some digs, trying to identify what was grown and when all these things happened and how these uh, gardens may have been managed. Everyone would love to know. Um, that said, there aren't too many varieties from the Midwest that uh, survived um, the, the change to hybrids, the change to dent corns, and all of the uh, transformations brought by um, the European settlement of this area. This container that you see here is a, a bulk of what remains of the Menominee flint corn, and uh, this sample is 50 years old. Flint corn did move north of the lakes as well. And the archaeologists there have found um, <clears throat> evidence of corn being eaten uh, by actually finding leftover uh, phytoliths and other starch granules on uh, clay pot remains way up by Lake Winnipeg and beyond from 1500 years ago. So trade routes at least were bringing corn 1500 years ago up into what is now Southern Canada. And corn was fairly common in such findings uh, for the last thousand years. And uh, we don't know precisely when or who was growing corn there if they were at all, but we do know from historical time that uh, Native Americans and of course, uh, European settlers that came to Minnesota and Ontario were growing flint corns and uh, flint corns were growing up north of Lake of the Woods as well. There weren't too many that are uh, recommended 
uh, by the 1930s anymore. Uh, Dakota white still exists. I'm not sure what pearl white would have been. Some of the other varieties I mentioned previously and some others from the plains have been grown here. And uh, people do still uh, play around with some of these. I mentioned the autophile there just because I see it's in the commerce these days. That's an Italian variety, but that's another long story. Um, same sort of uh, places you can go commercially and to USDA and to seed saving organizations to find seed and find out more about them. Um, however, the flints and flowers go very much further west as the Missouri River uh, system brought uh, these varieties north from the uh, Kanza and Otto and Missouri country of the southern part of that river system, north uh, from the Pawnees as well, through the uh, Arikara country and on up. So up in Fort Berthold, where the Noeta or Mandans, the Hidatsa and the Sanish, or previously called Arikaras, uh, these were the uh, people of the earth houses and they had extensive villages made of those and they grew quite a lot of corn. Uh, that corn made it into uh, commerce as well as uh, corn seed was given as a gift to some of the immigrants to help them, uh, including Oscar Will who uh, sold his Dakota White Flint, uh, which came from, from the Fort Berthold folks. You can see it in the uh, catalog cover from 1919. It's the second from the left. Um, women of all of the corn cultures uh, grew these fields close to the rivers in this relatively dry country where the soils were a little bit uh, gentler and the weather a little bit more friendly for growing corn. And uh, there's a great book by uh, Will and Hyde from 1917, I think it is, uh, Corn Among the Indians of the Upper Missouri. So you can see a lot about what was studied by scientists at the time, including this lovely documentation of some of the Mandan varieties, both soft and hard. Uh, and you can see the, the greater predominance of 12 row ears among uh, their varieties, which is common for the type. Uh, maize moved further west, however, uh, in more recent years, as Native Americans were forced west, as Native Americans were fleeing the, uh, the wars in the Midwest in the 1860s and onward up into Canada uh, seeking refuge. They took corn with them. Uh, corn was also introduced uh, by the BIA to some of the established reservations. And it was mostly at this point, uh, seed coming from uh, the, the Fort Berthold folks, Noeta, Hidatsa, and Sanish. As you can see the, the resemblance here, of course, at Fort Peck in Eastern Montana. Uh, Corn moved with other groups as well up into Canada with the refugee Dakotas. And uh, many of the immigrants also began growing some of those varieties that Oscar Will and some of the others in North Dakota were selling. Uh, corn moved all the way into the Rockies and some of the protected valleys. Here's a picture from 1915, uh, 45 bushels of the acre of some variety grown in the Flathead Valley. And again, you can see that this is relatively short compared to some of the Eastern types. And you may have heard of Painted Mountain and seen uh, some of the other uh, newer varieties of flints and flowers that are being developed by folks all in this region these days. It's Dave Christensen out there in Big Sky Country. So recommended varieties for the West, uh, there were a few. Dakota white was still recommended in the 30s, uh, Australian white and Crawford yellow uh, further south into Colorado and Wyoming. Um, but Burley County mixed, uh, Cascade, Great Plains Rainbow, Mandan Bride, uh, there are many others that uh, are grown out here that do work. And again, there are quite a few people sharing different varieties with whom you can consult. And then I will finish my portion here with um, just to mention some of the ongoing contributions of this wonderful kind of corn. So indigenous people shared this variety when they first met uh, Europeans and Europeans benefited gratefully from this and passed it down. And so by the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, um, 
Europeans are developing youth programming, including corn clubs, where kids were taught how to grow corn and how to select corn and save seeds. And Northern Flint was a part of this in some states. Uh, these corn clubs eventually became the 4-H clubs and that whole program owes a lot to uh, the Flint corns that were a part of uh, what those kids were getting taught, you know, 100 years ago. Northern Flint was used in uh, corn breeding by farmers and then later by uh, university and professional breeders. So all the field corn you've seen has Northern Flint corn in its parentage. And that is how uh, this productive kind called corn belt dent was developed mostly through accidental and then eventually by intentional crossing. And then, uh, well, I, I have to say that also the seed companies and universities and uh, professional breeders shared Northern Flint all over the world. So Northern Flint corn has become an important part of agriculture all across Northern Eurasia, South Africa, uh, the very Southern part where it's kind of chilly, um, and uh, Southern South America as well. Uh, there's been a lot of R8 row corn has moved uh, into uh, central Chile and uh, Southern or central uh, Argentina where corn can be grown. And then of course, I have to say that uh, Northern Flint corn is uh, the backbone of uh, indigenous agriculture and is featured mightily in the very exciting development of the food sovereignty movement and indigenous seed keeping movements that we see today. So always love to highlight that. There's a lot of it moving around and people are very happy to see it. And uh, it's a wonderful thing that it is still with us after more than a thousand years and everything that's transpired along the way. So I will stop sharing and uh, Great. turn over to Heather and Rebecca. Whew, that was very cool, <laughs> Frank. I learned so much and wow, yeah, amazing. So I don't know, I don't even know what to say. It's like there's, uh, it, yeah, it's complicated, but yet so interesting. It's too bad. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm saying. My head is so full of thoughts right now. I guess I'll just move on because it's so fascinating. Uh, we do have time for a question. Um, Katrina was asking a question. I don't know if she wants to. Hi. Hi. Um, this was so interesting. I'm coming at this from sort of a, I love to bake. And so I want to learn all about grains. So I feel like a kid that ended up in the wrong classroom trying to understand a lot of what you all are talking about, but it's really, really interesting. And I was just curious, so this is probably like a very silly biology based question, but how do all of those amazing colors end up in all the different kernels? I always thought there was like one, each kernel had its own thread, you know, its own piece at the top. And so we, but how could there be different colors in the same, I just had that kind of question, like how do the, how do the, um, cobs get so colorful. Well, it's magic, of course. Uh, and <laughs> that's we what have I some, thought. I figured we're all understanding of the magic, but it's always magical. So um, <clears throat> there are different parts in the corn kernel. There's the hull, which is mother tissue, and then there's the endosperm and the the germ inside. That is part of the new individual that has been born after the uh, silk was uh, pollinated and uh, the new embryo has been starting to grow. The outermost cell layer of the endosperm can have its own color and the endosperm itself can have a color. So the endosperm, uh, usually we see white or yellow in the endosperm. This outer layer of the endosperm is where we would see blue colors if blue develops. And then uh, the hull is where we would tend to see red colors or pink colors develop. And these can all overlay to make fascinating collages of color. When it's in the, uh, when it's in the hull, the entire ear can be one color or depending on uh, expression can have some different patches on the ear that have that reddish sort of tone. Depending on who the fathers are, can change where white or yellow or blue appear. And so every ear is a gift. 
and uh, you know, accept them and just say, thank you. They're <laughs> so wonderful to see. These don't all cook up the same way. So if you are looking for a blue cornbread or a red cornbread or an orange cornbread, uh, some of the beautiful mixtures of colors give you more of a kind of a gray tone. But you know, uh, people have found so many different ways to uh, cook each separate kind for their own purposes. I'm sure uh, somewhere along the line, you'll find a variety that works great for you that you'll always be so happy to eat. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's just so interesting to learn so much about corn. And I love the fact that the Flint corn is, can be pop, is related so closely to popcorn, like all the different corns, what you said at the beginning with how they're all kind of like cousins, you know? So we, yesterday, correct me if I'm wrong, Heather, but yesterday it seemed like there was more of a distinction. Like these are different types of corns. And it feels like what you just said, Frank, is actually, no, this is like, we're just all in the same family. And these are like different branches of it. Well, you know, <laughs> biologists, there are two kinds that always fight. There are the splitters who really love diversity and feel each kind is special and needs its own name. And then there are lumpers like myself. We're like, we're all related. It's all good. And, uh, you know, it's just a point of view. Corn is what it is. <laughs> I, I love it. And I feel like that's what I'm as a lover of corn, which I just feel like I'm amongst my family here talking about corn. I just, just the way you presented that, Frank, I'm just having a hard time. Like, I love it. You know, I love just feeling like corn's just a big family and it sort of depends, you know, what you want out of your corn, whatever sort of, you know, when people were actively really out in the field selecting for what it was they wanted, you know, they just eventually ended up hope, like getting it. Um, and then maybe even having multiple types there that all came probably from the same parents, but then they just started picking those that were more flowery, flowery or dense. So it's just, anyway, it is a gift and I love it. I'm, I've, I'm not speechless that often either. <laughs> so this is really great. It's great to feel this way. Um, all right, so let's see, I'm just gonna check because we do have another, we have a little bit of time. Um, all right, well, I think we'll move on then, Rebecca, if you're ready. Um, and then, yeah, we can wrap up with a great conversation at the end, I'm sure. Ooh. I think it's because it's so warm in here. That must be it. Segoli swagwek, ganyat de gay lun yungyat, sungwe huene, Becky Webster, and yungyat o slunige, or guaho niwigit to load, oniate aga, niwigit a hoen jolt, delunkawane, ni wagenyu. So in English, what I just said is hello, everybody. My name is ganyat de gay, which means snow scattered here and there. My English name is Becky Webster. I'm Wolf Clan, I'm Oneida, and I grew up near Duck Creek that runs through our reservation. So um, what I'm gonna be talking today about is uh, a little bit um, picking right up where Frank left off on the food sovereignty movement in the United States and really taking us through a trip of our history as indigenous people. So I'm gonna talk about the, the culture, the history, and then also some um, local food movements that are trying to preserve and celebrate our corn. Then I'm gonna talk about a little bit some of the Haudenosaunee varieties that we grow here. And then the hulling process, that's, that's the million dollar question, right? About how do we hull and cook this corn that we so lovingly grow? So I know you heard a lot about the um, archeological findings and whatnot of uh, where our corn comes from and how it traveled. But it's important to note that for Haudenosaunee people, our story starts with the creation story. So we start here. We say, and so it is, they say, that Sky Woman brought seeds from the sky world. So this is actually um, toward the beginning, not, not the beginning, beginning of our creation story. So there's a part in it where there's a woman. Um, she's not a human. She's a sky person. She's pregnant and she's living in the sky world. And um, she ends up falling through a hole in the sky, falls down the earth and lands on turtle's back. And she acquires some dirt and begins to um, dance around the dirt on the back of the turtle, 
which then forms Turtle Island. Of course, I'm missing all kinds of details here, but we only have so much time. So when she does this, she combines those seeds that she had in her hands that she was grasping from when she was in the sky world and they stay dormant for a while. So she ends up giving birth and time passes and uh, the, the daughter that she gives birth to grows into a, a young woman herself and she eventually becomes pregnant, but she, she's pregnant with twins, twin boys. One twin is born the normal way and the other twin is really impatient and wants to just get out. And he bursts through her side and kills her. And um, there's a little bit of family dynamics here. It turns out that the grandmother, Sky Woman, ends up favoring this one that came out her side, the left-handed twin. And the, the right-handed twin who was born the normal way is blamed for her death. And the, because they're not humans, they are sky people, they age and mature at varying different rates than, than human babies would be. So after she dies, Sky Woman tells the, the right-handed twin that he needs to cover her body up with the soil. And here is the Mother Earth Garden representation that we have. So um, currently in our community, except of course for during the pandemic, um, we have a group called De Duaduna Denyes, and that means we are changing our lives. It's a rites of passage program where young men and women learn about the transition into adulthood and their responsibilities to each other and to the community as they become um, men and women who are gonna be you know, set loose on society. So we teach them about our culture, our language, our history, and our gardening. So one of the things that they do here is they recreate part of that creation story and they plant a mother earth garden. So out of um, this, this body that the boys end up shaping, the girls come by and plant seeds, sing seed songs and transplant some plants here. So after um, Sky Woman's daughter is buried underneath the soil, her sacrifice activates those seeds that Sky Woman brought down with her. And out of her mind comes tobacco. Out of her breasts is, rises the corn. Out of her heart is the strawberries. Out of her stomach is the squash. Out of her hands is the beans. Out of her feet is the potatoes. So all of these different things are brought forth by the sacrifice of Sky Woman's daughter. And by going through this process, we learn about the different types of plants and their responsibilities and how they help heal our minds and our bodies. So those three sisters that we talk about, the corn, bean, and squash in particular, in addition to the other plants that are coming out of Sky Woman's body, our daughter's body, have different roles and responsibilities. The three corn, beans, and squash come together and they stay together. So we have stories about why it's important that they're always planted together and they're not meant to be separated. So they have different roles and responsibilities. So here's just a close up of one of the three sisters that uh, was growing at our, at our farmstead. The corn is growing tall and strong, serving as a support for the beans. You can kind of look closely and see the beans just twirling around the corn stalk, reaching for the sky and they provide nitrogen to the soil. And then the squash, um, I like to call the squash the underrated sister because she has some really big responsibilities. She covers the ground and keeps moisture in the ground on that, that mounded dirt. And she also keeps the weeds out and she helps keep the animals out because the animals don't like to step through their prickly leaves and stems. So now, this is, it, it, we, like Frank was mentioning, we have a really um, a tragic history, um, indigenous people throughout the United States. Um, so after, when the Europeans first arrived on our shores, they marveled at our agricultural accomplishments. They waxed poetic in the journals that the explorers kept. They were completely amazed at how we were able to accomplish all of this with our primitive technology. And then, of course, the journals of the military folks came in afterward, and that's what they targeted first. They targeted our cornfields, our orchards, and our food caches. So 
oftentimes they talked about how they didn't even bother to try to kill the people when they were sweeping through our territories and especially during the revolutionary war and instead they just took our food and, and burned the rest so um after the revolutionary war in particular the oneida people um realized that there were a lot of um, illegal treaties with the state of new york that weren't sanctioned by the federal government and we really didn't have any other choice. We were essentially homeless. Our, our homes were burned and destroyed. There was a whole lot of negative influence from alcoholism. And we really wanted to try to, to go somewhere else to be able to restart our lives and regain our agricultural way of life. So in the early 1800s, we um, were removed to what is now Wisconsin um, and as soon as we landed here, we began to clear land and plant those seeds again. So since the early 1800s, we have been growing these foods here in our community. Well, in the early 1800s, um, we, were, we were carrying on and we were year after year, we were growing and becoming more successful with our agriculture. And then in 1887, Congress got the idea to pass what is known as the General Allotment Act. And what this did is it broke up our tribal land holdings, whereas previously the whole tribe owned the land together. And uh, this act divided up the whole reservation into smaller parcels and gave ownership to individual tribal members. And that land would soon become taxable. You could sell it, you could have a mortgage on it. And that was really devastating. The whole goal was to break up tribal land holdings and it worked because within one generation, the Oneida people here in Wisconsin, we lost title to about 95% of our land. So when you lose that much ownership of your land, it's really difficult to carry on your agricultural way of life. So, um, but even despite that, in the early 1900s, late 1930s, early 1940s, with Roosevelt's New Deal, he um, had made government money available for projects. One of them is the Works Progress Administration. And one of those Works Progress Administration um, projects came in the Oneida Reservation where Oneida tribal members got paid to collect stories from other tribal members. So this is a really amazing glimpse of time um, to see what was going on at the reservation on, at that time. And we see there that even though we had just lost so much of our land, that corn remained an integral part of our daily and our ceremonial lives. So there were enough people in our community that were able to hold on and keep those seeds going. So over time, you know, we have this ebbing and flowing, but currently, um, as you notice from Frank's last slide, the, the indigenous food sovereignty movement, we are in a revival. So this is like what, the time I like to say, it's a good day to be indigenous because now we can celebrate. It's safe to bring our seeds out and to share them with each other and to grow them without having to worry about something like this happening, which has happened in our past over and over again. So with that, here's a, a, an image of my daughter planting squash seeds in a three sisters mound. So every time an indigenous person plants a seed, that is an act of resistance, an assertion of sovereignty and a reclamation of identity. Because for us, it's more than just, you know, the science or the archeology span behind these seeds. We have a relationship with these seeds that go back all the way to creation. And corn plays a significant role in creation um, in just different spots of that story. And we recognize that we have that reciprocal relationship. And even though history has not been kind to us, that we can recognize that, that she has walked along our side that entire journey from creation and even to today. And even when we had so much taken away from us that we can assert ourselves and reclaim that identity uh, today in, in 2021. And we do so here on our farmstead, right in our front, front yard. So anybody driving by can see we're having our three sisters gardens. We have different trellises for our beans. We just um, want to do that out in the open um, to assert ourselves, but also to encourage other people in the community to grow and establish that relationship with our foods again. So we do this in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, locally. So Ohelagu, that's among the corn stalks. So what was going on is um, the Oneida Nation has some really amazing programs. They have Junhenkwa, which is a 
a farm that grows a lot of our corn. Um, they have the cannery that processes the corn and then the Oneida, Oneida markets that sells the corn to the community. Well, there was times that um, they did such an amazing job to increase our demand for that corn that they ran out and they would regularly have signs at the market saying, I'm sorry, we're out of corn and people would get really upset and they would yell at the tribe and say, hey, why aren't you growing more corn? We want more corn. And a bunch of us families got together and said, hold on, wait a minute. Maybe it's not the government's responsibility to be growing this corn for us. Maybe the community needs to step it up a little bit and help out in that regard. So we formed in 2015 and we have about 10 Oneida families and we plant six acres of corn together each year. And you'll notice on the top right, that's a, a husking bee that we had, I think two years ago, our, our husking bee lasted six weeks because we had such an amazing crop that year. So um, every day we would go out to the field, pick some corn, and then load it up into our trucks and come back to the barn and put that corn in the barn. And then we just camp out around of it, around that pile, pull back the husks and get them ready for braiding to hang up so that they can dry. Um, and in that harvesting part where we go to the fields on the bottom right hand side, you'll see a bunch of children out there picking the corn. And I just want to assure everybody that this is not child labor. It's passing on traditions, just in case anyone was worried. All right, so we took some of these lessons that we were learning at, in the co-op to work on our farmstead. So we purchased 10 acres on the Oneida Reservation. Um, and we currently grow Haudenosaunee varieties of corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and tobacco. And we also try to host events talking about planting, growing, harvesting, seed keeping, food preparation, food storage, and making traditional tools and crafts. So this has been a real adventure here on our farm. And on the right-hand side, um, we're, that's my husband and I, and I'm holding a um, Iroquois uh, sweet corn, and my husband is holding Iroquois blue corn. So um, that's some of the varieties that we grow here on the farmstead. So we also have a uh, YouTube, which is um, Kowloon Gwakwa, and I, I think I got a slide of that later. And then we have an Instagram account where we share our, you know, farming adventures. So this has all been a really amazing journey. Um, and I should let you know that the name of the farmstead is Ungwakwa Jitnuni Ungwaya Toslu. It means our foods, where we plant things. So when we were um, getting the idea for this farmstead, we bought the land and we were getting ready to go for it. We talked to an Oneida faith keeper about our plans for this property, and that's the name that he gave us. So we're pretty excited to be able to carry that name and help our community out by having all of these different varieties of foods and being another resource in addition to the resources we already have through the nation to try to um, move our community more in the food sovereignty movement. Any, any bit helps, we like to say. All right, so some of the things that we are a little bit concerned about is cross-pollination. And especially with corn, um, the, that corn pollen can travel in the air and in the wind for quite some time. And especially when we're concerned that we are surrounded literally surrounded on our farmstead by GMO cornfields. So that's a little bit um, makes us nervous because, well, first off, we think that's culturally inappropriate to do those things to our seeds because we consider our seeds to be our relatives. Um, one of the things we could do is we could hand pollinate, but um, we grow uh, so much corn here that we that's just not a viable option. It would be too labor intensive on top of how it already is labor intensive to be able to do that. Um, but sometimes some things can happen. You can get new varieties or hybrids. So like, for example, here is a, a shriveled up little ear of our uh, Iroquois sweet corn. So we grew a field of that last year on our farmstead. And while I was harvesting, I had noticed some of the cobs were really big and this came out. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure somewhere down the line that um, there was likely a cross-pollination or, or some other, some, something clearly happened. But when we talk about this in our cultural terms, um, we're not as concerned with the science of it. We didn't do this on purpose. It happened, um, but we recognize that what's going on is that these seeds are remembering their relatives. 
So all corn is related and that she is telling us something and we're not quite sure what that message is, but, but we're trying to listen as best as we can. And we're, we plan on planting that corn at some point in the future to see what happens because she appeared for a reason. And um, it was kind of strange how the rest of the field was all corn that looked just like this. And there were only those few cobs that turned out like that. But the other thing that we wanna to try to keep in mind is that we don't know what's gonna happen with, with that corn when we plant it. So we do try to avoid those types of things when we're seed selecting, because we wanna to try to get our seeds that are true to type. And that will help, especially newer growers, because it'll be predictable and you'll know what's, what, what to make of it and how it's going to grow. So we wanna to try to make sure that we preserve those. And also because the seeds carry stories. And if you change who they are, then that story isn't theirs anymore. They have a new story. So we wanna to try to preserve that along the line as well. So when we gather up our seeds and we're, we're doing our seed saving, so some of the things that we look for, um, look for the best characteristics in the plants, the foods and the seeds. So like, for example, um, here is some of our, our shorter Oneida white flower corn. So when we go to select for seed for the corn, we think of the corn as, um, as a woman's body. So here, here's the corn and here's the woman's body and right underneath where my hand is, like if, if she, this was a person, that's where our babies would be, would be coming from, our middle area. So this is where we take our seed corn from. And everything on top of this and everything below it is used for soup or, or ground into flour or what have you. We eat the rest of this. So we only save seed from that very middle part. And um, I know there was a question in the chat earlier about whether or not you can plant what we sent you. We didn't send seed grade corn. And um, I was a little nervous about sending out that much corn that could potentially sprout. I sent it to you with the intention that you would eat it and not that you would plant it um, because we are a little bit cautious about who we share our seed with. Um, because some really awful and terrible things have happened to seeds that we have shared with um, people that we didn't know or we didn't trust. So just um, I ask that you not plant the, the corn that we gave you and that you do use that for the purpose that it was intended, which is for seed. And for corn, um, this particular variety, we look for eight straight rows and we look for consistent colors, no dents, no dimples. Nothing strange happening with this one. So this one was selected for seed. And we need to make sure they're dry um, uh, and, and fully matured before harvest. Because if you pick them when they're too young, they might not germinate. Uh, we also um, want to make sure they're dry. I actually, a few years ago, um, tried to put away some squash seeds before they were dry. And the next day I looked at them and they started to mold in the jar. So I quickly spread them out again and um, let them dry even more. And also you wanna store them in a cool, dry place out of the sun. This one's important. Carefully label your seeds. You might think you're gonna remember what they are. And if you're like me, you're gonna forget. So if we carefully label and keep track of where the seeds are coming from, that's really helpful. And on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see we just, we're pretty excited about this. We got a stamp with our farm Farmstead logo on it. So this year, anyone that's gonna trade with us for seeds is gonna get a, a fancy little package that has an update with our Farmstead logo on there. And a bonus here, I had mentioned the stories so that if your seeds have a story, um, be sure to share that with those people that you share your seeds with. Because again, these aren't just something that's a commodity to us. They are our relatives and they have a story and we want to make sure that that's preserved as they get shared with different people in our community. Um, and uh, so here's some of the varieties of corn that, that we have grown uh, as the uh, co-op. So on the right-hand side, that's the Tuscarora white flower corn. And that's a, a, a really long uh, corn that uh, we've, we, is really popular in our community here. It's the most versatile. And if anyone just says corn in our community, that's probably the kind that they're talking about. We use it in all kinds of our recipes. And that's really the focus of, in the later half of this presentation, that's the type of corn that we use the most. 
right next to it is called a uh, Hegewa corn. And this is a much smaller um, cob, still an eight row corn from uh, friends from out east. And we grew that in a field and um, I haven't grown it again since, but we hope to in the future. So on our farmstead, these are a few, few varieties. Uh, I had left out, I believe a bear paw popcorn out of here, um, but going from left to right, uh, we have grandmother corn, uh, we have a black Iroquois black sweet corn, Iroquois wampum dent, Iroquois blue, Mohawk red, and the Oneida white flower corn that I just held up. So we have a, a different types of corn in it. Uh, they make sense to pick them at different times, um, depending on if you're going to want to eat them like a sweet corn, or if you're gonna to want to um, let them fully mature out in the field so you can um, grind them up or hull them later for soups and such. And also the, you'll notice that they all have flowers on the top. And this actually, aside from it being very pretty, it has a functional purpose. If you recall back to the slide where we showed our barn, um, let me see if I can just find it really quick. Oh, right here. So we have tons of corn hanging in our barn. And when we find um, a cob that is potential seed quality, you know, we'll look at it and pass it around and, and um, somebody will ultimately be the judge of whether or not that is qualified as a seed as a seed cob. And if it is, we braid those up special in their own braids. And then we put the flowers on top to make sure that when it's hanging in the barn like this, that we don't lose track of them because it can be pretty easy to lose track of that, that seed corn. And here is um, a friend of mine who has Gahulahale Farmstead. She's also part of our co-op and, and did something similar to what we're doing. They have a, a farmstead um, on the northern part of the reservation and they have grown Onondaga strawberry popcorn. So this is pretty exciting. I eventually also wanna grow this kind of corn too and, um, and check it out. All right, so why hull our corn? And uh, some of you may be familiar with the term nixtamalization. So this does a whole lot of really great things. And, and when I talk about this, I just keep thinking, dang, my ancestors were geniuses. They had all this figured out. They were so smart. And I'm just glad that there were enough people that held on to that knowledge so that I can learn this and, and uh, practice this today. So it dissolves the outer hull of the kernels that our body cannot digest. So what's going on in this picture here is there's a large kettle full of boiling water and hardwood ashes. That's the little darkness that you see underneath of it. And the, that hardwood ashes causes that chemical reaction, kind of like a lye, to be able to start eating away at the outer hull of the corn. Kind of like if you know, if you have um, pop some popcorn and those the, the hulls that are left in the inside of your popcorn, those are the thing, that's what's getting dissolved off of these kernels. So when they're dissolved off of there, it becomes easier to grind into flour. And it also improves the nutritional profile of the corn, adding all kinds of things, including calcium. It makes a niacin in the corn available for our bodies to absorb. And it also does other things. So um, again, recall the picture of the corn all hanging in the barn. If it's, it takes a little bit for it to fully, fully dry. So in that process, there's a little bit of moisture in there. So that moisture can quickly turn to mold or fungus that um, we try to, obviously we, we watch for it and we try to take care of it as soon as we see it, but we're gonna miss them uh, certainly because you can't catch it all. But by boiling it in this hardwood ashes, it kills off any of that dangerous stuff that's on that corn uh, that grew there from when it was drying. So then it becomes safe again for us to eat. And it brings out more flavor. And as I mentioned, the ashes provide calcium. So that chemical reaction turns our, um, this is our white corn, it flashes this amazing fluorescent orange color. And when that you get that flash of color, you know that's the chemical reaction that's happening. And then um, here's some of the things that we make with our, with our corn. So at the top left-hand side, we have um, some of our cornbread. It's our gonna stow hull. So this is made with corn that we hulled, but we didn't cook the inside of the kernel. We just hulled it so that the outside kernel could, um, the hull could be dissolved, making sure that the flour inside remained uncooked. 
And then when the, after it was hulled, we washed it really good. And then we ground it up and we um, used baked, um, cooked some beans. And then we um, formed them using boiling water, formed them into these cakes and then put them back into boiling water to make our cornbread. And this is one of our most common ways to prepare our corn. Another very common way underneath it is our corn soup. So this is um, one of my favorite tasty treats and that's just corn, beans and um, you know pork hocks are, are some different type of meat in there. Right under it and the middle picture, those little balls in there, those are just small versions of our gunna stow hall. And we use them like dumplings. And we um, sometimes put ramps or other onions or our different seasonings that we gather to help flavor them up for the soups. And also in that bottom left-hand side, you can see there's some lighter um, corn kernels in there that we picked that corn at the green corn stage. And um, that's put into that soup as well. So that's green corn soup with Gunnestohal dumplings. And, um, and the far right hand side, this is something that we just experimented with. Um, we had heard stories about using berries and maple syrup to make the Gunnestohal. So we did that and uh, we just took it one step further to make it fun and we put it into a turtle shaped little tiny cake pan. So we call them the maple berry turtle Gunnestohals, which are popular around our community. And um, so here's just some of the different ingredients and here's that uh, bright fluorescent orange I had talked about. And when we haul our corn after, we, after that happens, we use a corn washing basket and we run it under some cool water and we rub the corn on the sides of the walls of this basket to be able to take the hull off and make sure that it's, it's all um, removed from the corn. And the top picture there, that's just some of the, the tools that we use to be able to hull our corn. And here's the YouTube channel that I mentioned. This is just a quick glimpse of the, the, our banner for Ungwakwa. And at the bottom, here's just some of the different videos that are on there. Um, we talk about soaking corn in tea for planting. So we use a May apple tea to be able to make sure that our corn has a, a, a really good start that it's protected from pests and to make birds not wanna eat it. Um, we talk about our selecting for our seed corn and then making those pretty little flowers that are on top to help identify them. We have hulling corn and then we have a gunna stohal, which is our Oneida boiled cornbread. So this channel is really meant to be a resource for people that wanna learn about uh, the different things that we have and it's, it's I try to keep the videos to less than six minutes, um, just because I know we all have a pretty short attention span sometimes. And it's, I think it's a great way to be able to communicate with different people about our different practices. And especially um, because we have to recognize that so many indigenous people have been removed from their communities, lost ties from their communities and are finding ways to reconnect. So we're also hoping that this channel can help bring people home. Uh, the same way that we're bringing our seeds home so we can reestablish relationships with the people and with the seeds. And Yawankoa, thank you. So these are some pictures of some dolls I made with the husks from these corns. Um, of course, that would be really neat if those other, uh, the, the colorful corn, the husks came in those colors, but um, I just used dye to make the different colors and um, I think it represents the differences that we all have in our communities, but we all need to come together to try to figure it out. And that's all I had. Thank you, Rebecca. That was great. This is my son, Flint. <laughs> <laughs> Love the name. You can thank Frank Kudka for that. <laughs> hey, I don't know if, it, yeah. So, so Flint was the Flint was also the name of the left-handed twin. <laughs> oh, there you he, go. Met, he missed the story because he went to the bathroom. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and he came back and he wanted to know why is there a turtle? And I said, You missed it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, so Frank had sent uh Jack Laser and myself a a coffee can of corn, flint corn, that he called Pete Seeger's Flint, 
which was like a, a mashup, I call it a mashup, non-scientific term for population, I guess. <laughs> and he said, here you guys go, you know, do with it what you want. And that was the year that Flint was born. So we've been, um, when you were talking about your seeds having a story, I immediately looked at Flint thinking, oh, do you want me to get all mushy with you right now and lovey-dovey? And he said, no. <laughs> but <laughs> that's that's my seed um, story. So we've been our team, uh, many of them on here every year are planting. And I was thinking about I'm I'm taking over the whole conversation right now. But I was thinking about um, how we sit in this huge wagon of corn. And it's one of the best times that I feel like everybody has. We weren't able to do that much this year where we're picking through this corn much in the same way you were talking about um, and sort of, is this ear okay to save? Do you think this one will make good good seed? And, um, and so we have this special tray for the seed and then we have this huge bin uh, for all the other very special seed too, but not to be put back in the ground. So that's our, our small, um, seed story, but it really, um, that's what I thought of when you were talking. So thanks for, thanks for your presentation. It was really wonderful. Um, all right. So there are some questions, Rebecca, I think you can answer. What's that? Yeah. That, <laughs> he wants to leave now. Can I go? <laughs> um, that people are asking about using ash for nixmalization. And I know that um, it's in, in your video, I think, but um, any, uh, any tips? <laughs> yeah, so we, I, I saw the comment too about soaking it and I have heard that I didn't, I haven't tried that yet myself. I'm just going off of the way that I was taught how to do it. And we use um, quite a bit of ash. We use one cup of ash to one pound of corn. So, um, and we think that um, that is, that's just the, the amount that has helped to be able to get that chemical reaction. And, um, we, you have to really work at it. It's not easy. Um, there's, it's a long time to be able to, um, when you're rinsing it to make sure that that ash gets off of there. And I think other people have done, um, they use, um, lye or they use baking soda and, I, I actually don't like the taste of that. Um, I can taste the difference. Um, maybe it's an acquired taste, but um, I really prefer to cook it in the hardwood ashes. It, it actually adds to the nutritional profile that's in the corn. And it's something that our traditional, our indigenous instructions talk about that that's how we were meant to cook our corn is, is doing that. And um, yeah, you have to do a really good job of rinsing your corn. Otherwise you're gonna, you're gonna have some ashy soup there. You also have to make sure you don't have any clinkers in there. Is it just just pure dusty ash? Oh yeah, you want to use sifted ash for sure. You want to sift it and make sure it's clean and make sure it came from a clean source. You don't want to like go in your fire pit in your yard that you are burning like who knows what in there. You definitely, this is, it needs to be food grade. Um, so the way that we do this is um, sometimes we'll go to Maple Camp and if we're using only hardwood, hardwoods to boil down that year, we'll use those ashes. Or um, we have a trade network. There's a line of folks in Menominee who heat their homes with just hardwood and they'll empty those ash, ash containers and they'll trade us for corn. And the sifting is a really, you need to, you need to mask up when you do that because the first time I tried it without masking up, I had black snot for days. <laughs> And we know, everybody knows about that. I certainly do. <laughs> this is great. I, I've done it with uh, ash and water uh, before I add the corn and I bring it to a, to a boil and then turn it down and let it cool and the ash settles. And that ash water will nixtamalize the corn. Uh, you just decant it and leave the ash behind. Yeah, when I'm scooping the corn out, the, the ashes will sift to the bottom. So I scoop it out individually and then put them into the corn washing basket. 
Yeah, you and especially you don't want to put that down your drain because that can be really terrible for your plumbing. So we um, take the the heavy ash water at the bottom and toss it out. And especially we do, I don't know, maybe about 10 pounds in a kettle at a time. So that's 10 cups of ashes that's going to be sitting in that kettle that you don't want in your pipes. I think that's what I remember the most from um, one of your YouTube videos, Rebecca. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> don't dump it down the drain. <laughs> um, Azur, do you want to ask uh, Rebecca your question about tortillas? Uh, hi. I'm curious if in the processes that you, you do, if you also have uh, tortillas, I mean, you're already next tamalize and you're almost one step up closer but just just wondering if you do that over there we've um tried and been unsuccessful <laughs> but we have made um tam uh, uh tamales so those worked oh yeah yeah i love tamales yeah. we there must be some trick to being able to get it just right but um yeah we keep, we keep trying the other well, thing I though is when we grind it it's a dry grind we don't um it's not a wet grind so if we thought maybe right after we do the hulling if we were to grind it right there that might be better for making the tortillas we're not yeah sure. well i'm i'm glad to to talk off site and i know there's a whole mixed tamalization module that will review all of this stuff but uh, i mean we we next tamalize about almost 500 pounds of corn a day. Um, so there's some things that can probably inform your process over there. So I'm saying I'll be glad to help. Thank you. Uh, John and Mary, you had a question about cross pollination. Did you wanna, oh, there they are. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for your presentation. We'd like to know how you can grow so many varieties of corn on 10 acres. How do you keep them from crossing? Well, we, we don't grow all of these in one year. So this is over a number of years. We try to keep it to three varieties of year. And that's pretty much what we've done. And the way we do that is we have, um, especially one, a tree line in our property and with very careful seed selection, but we also plant um, by how long of a season they are. So like we'll plant 110 day um, next to a 90 day and then just watch, or not right next to, but then watch for the cross uh, when, when they tassel. So we have done 125 day and a 90 day next to each other without any crossing issues. But again, it, and they don't always express themselves in that first generation either that it was crossed. So we're just really careful when we do seed select. And we know sometimes that no matter what, you're, you're likely to end up with some cross pollination from somewhere, whether it be your own corn or your neighbor's corn. But yeah, we don't grow like that many varieties on, on our farms that especially that we don't hand pollinate. Um, we just are, are pretty careful about the timing and location of them. Thank you. Yeah. So if you have additional questions or even comments, you know, feel free to un unmute yourself, um, speak up or, or type it in the in the chat box. Um, I had a question actually for both, you know, you and Frank. I'm, I'm curious, does any um, selection traditionally happen in the field? Because it seemed like um, the selection you were talking about, Rebecca, is, you know, once the corn's harvested and you're looking at the ears. But I just wondered, um, is it like, is, are there traditions around being in the field and seeing the plant itself or, yes. you know, the health of the plant or something and, and selecting that way? Yes. So that's the first time that we go through and harvest is we're harvesting for seed. And we look for something that's between your waist and your shoulder. If it's, you know, a, a nice, thick, healthy looking cob. And also we want to make sure that the husks are separating a little bit. So they're starting to flower out um, because we want to pass that characteristic on to the next, uh, next generations. Because if it's still too tight, um, that might mean that that type, that corn is carrying um, some characteristics that won't let it dry properly in the field. 
and it could potentially have mold issues. Um, so yeah, we do, that's our first sweep. So we'll go through and harvest for seed corn, bring them back to the barn, open them up. And out of those, we select for seed even further. So when we have our seed corn, it is really the best of the best of the best. And then later on, as we're going through harvesting every now and then there'll be just a phenomenal cob that will come out that will also save that one too. I, I remember um, Margaret Smith being in the field with us at a field day one time and she was kicking the plants um, to make sure that they wouldn't fall over. And I, I guess I'm just thinking about this root system of Northern Flints being, you know, Frank, you kind of um, said it was weak. Maybe that wasn't the word that you used, but. Oh, that's the word I used. Uh, compared, yeah. <laughs> to, compared to those iron rods that grow out in the commercial fields, it, it's, it's a very different plant. The stalks are relatively soft. The roots are much less intense. Um, it's just a relative thing. The, the, the roots work, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I won't ask any more questions. I'll let other people. Um, uh, well, I'll, oh, I would just Frank like has to. has a question. <laughs> yeah, I have a question for you. So first, I'd like to finish with um, the selection process like that. And that what um, Becky was just explaining, this is what uh, seems to have been the pattern all across uh, the Northern Flint world for you know, more than a thousand years. Uh, the few times anthropologists actually talked with someone and wrote it down, it's the same thing. If, if any of you have read um, Mahidewi's words, uh, Buffalo Bird Woman's words about how to choose seed and maintain corn, um, it, it's almost word for word what, what Becky just said. You know, it's all about finding the very best ones and being grateful for those, saving them to the side. And, um, you know, all of it's a gift, but you, you, you eat you eat the corn that's there and the seed is just a special selection. And uh, the, the corn breeders will tell you that this is the most efficient way of adapting corn to a place. It is the fastest way you could possibly do it. Um, and uh, son of a gun, <laughs> with a thousand years, it's uh, greatly changed this corn. It is a wonderful diversity of well-adapted varieties all across the region. It's a, a beautiful thing. My question for everyone is, what do you think about the taste? What do you think about the flavor of flint and flower corn, if you've had any yet? So we will be tasting some tomorrow during our sensory workshop. Oh, maybe I shouldn't tell anybody that because it's supposed to be sort of a surprise, but we're only going to taste um, like corn water, basically. You know, we've milled it up and we'll add some water and people will be um, trying these different corns. But anyway, anyone? Oh, everybody's quiet <clears throat> today. Well, I've made a cornbread with blue corn and with white corn. And um, I found the flavor of the blue corn that I had. I think it was a it was called a Hopi Blue Dent, I think, that I bought from one of the seed catalogs. And I didn't like the flavor of that cornbread, but I had the white corn that I grew, um, that I was given in Navajo once. Uh, that tastes really good. Anyone else? Well, Henry, Henry, you must have something to say about this. He's been trying all of the corn <laughs> that we've been growing. <laughs> yeah, I try um, little samples here and there from the field trials. Um, definitely the flint corns have a much firmer, almost waxy texture to them. And the cooking process and extermolization process can take some time uh, longer than the dents and the flour. But even within them, the flavors are pretty amazing. They can be um, sweet or nutty or fruity um, or really corny. Uh, there's quite a bit of diversity uh, within varieties and types. Um, some I found are better for cornbreads um, and tortillas. So just 
experimenting with them a little bit and finding uh, what you know the appropriate end product is for each uh, type and variety. Um, Neat. Well, I just wanted to share that the first time I really had enough seed that I could eat some was back in the 90s. I had gotten some seeds from the Rickard family at Tuscarora in New York State. I was still living in Minnesota. And I shelled off these giant white kernels and I cooked it in uh, hardwood ashes and probably did a terrible job getting the hulls off. But you know, newbies. It was so fun to watch the process of this corn turning this crazy color of orange and then it turned sort of bluish and and then sort of faded from there. But uh, the flavor was just out of this world. And um, I really understood how, how all of this works when I was living in New York and went to the Indian State Fair which if you're not aware, uh, there's a separate section at the New York State Fair that was for Native Americans, been there for over a hundred years. And they have this uh, restaurant that served indigenous food and they had this lovely boiled uh, cornbread with the beans in it. And the flavor of that specific kind of beans with that specific kind of corn was just incredible. No, no spices were necessary. It was just good, just like it was. Just put a smile on your face. And, uh, you know, many varieties have their own special nuances. And uh, I think the flint corns are superb. And I, I'm actually a little bit disappointed that the slow food movement is picking out, picked out a couple to highlight rather than just say, hey, this stuff's all good because um, you know, especially we don't have to go to Italy to find good flint corn. <laughs> you know, people have been making it really good right here for a good long time. It's it's good stuff. So I, I hope everyone will get a chance to try try the sample that you have in your box and then uh, see what else comes your way along the way. Yeah, I'm curious if anybody did have a chance. I know a lot of people were just getting their boxes, so I just wondered if anybody had a chance to. Um uh use the white corn yet i don't I, oh there's john melquist have you he's, oh i was going to hey. make a comment but oh good perfect should i go ahead yeah okay um not with the white corn i haven't i haven't used it yet but um for many years i've grown alternate years two different kinds of corn one is hopi blue that i got originally from turtle tree seed and the other one is Painted Mountain that's been mentioned in this course. And um, I've always nishtimalized them using wood ashes. And what I've found making tortillas with both varieties, at least to my taste, Hopi Blue has an amazingly delicious flavor in a tortilla. Painted Mountain is not so good. But Painted Mountain is 20 days earlier, so I tend to favor that a bit and sometimes our Hopi blue doesn't s survive up here in, in Corinth. It doesn't actually make it to fruition um, because it's a longer season, but it's it's hands down for me, it's a really delicious variety to make into tortillas. That's my personal experience. Thanks, John. Hey, it's good to see You're you too. <laughs> Great to see you too. Hi, Heather. It's been a long time. Which corn was for tortillas? I'm sorry. Um, I'm you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've used two kinds. They're flower corns. One is called Hopi Blue. Came originally from Hopi Land, and um, you can get it from Turtle Tree Seed. And the other is called Painted Mountain, and that one comes from Montana. And you can get that from any number of seed companies. So they they Thanks. both make a good. Tortilla, but one tastes the yeah, the Hopi blue tastes much better in my view, or in my taste. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I hope everybody joined uh, enjoyed today. It, it is two o'clock. Um, thank you, Rebecca and Frank, and I know our our well, I know our paths are going to continue to cross because we have some new projects. Um, that we're, we're hoping to start up. And um, I'm really, really excited to continue working with you. And um, please check out all of uh, Rebecca's videos. They're really great and very informative. Um, they really helped me, <laughs> at least. 
And thank you again. And everybody, we'll see you tomorrow. And of course, uh, Rebecca and, and Frank, you're welcome to join us too if you have time for the corn tasting <laughs> um, or any of the other workshops. So have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.